We are here with Jeff Hoffman, one of the founders of Priceline. He's built multiple multi-billion dollar companies. He is as giving, sweet, and down to brass tacks as you could possibly want rolled up in one person. He really is a force of nature, and he's here to share with us and to help us grow today. Jeff, let's dive right in, my friend. And let's, Ooh, let's, gosh. Oh, <laughs> one thing we don't do well is waste time. <laughs> you, you don't help people at the margins. You exist to help people live an epic life. Now, every one of us as an entrepreneur and CEO can benefit from crystallizing our purpose, our, our platform, perhaps. How did you discover this purpose of yours? And, and take us into it. T tell us what it means to help someone have an epic life and how you deliver on that. Sure. But then we're going to take a minute here and back up because I have to tell you a little bit of a story that crystallized it for me. Let, uh, let's start by backing up. Chris, crystallize right. it. Uh, which, the best thing my... you'll learn I can do here is shut up and just let Jeff talk. <laughs> Uh, that was my uh, best friend, Michael. Um, and uh, Michael had a side hobby of, uh, uh, he was a climber, mountain climbing, really cliffs, climbing sheer cliffs. And Michael decided he was going to set the record for a little known sport called free solo, which is climbing a cliff without your security equipment, without your chains and your hammer and your hooks and the stuff that people usually, you know, hammer themselves and tie off a hook and, and, you know, attach themselves to the side of the mountain. He decided to climb some cliffs with none and set the world record. So this was Michael's hobby. He was working for me then. He wanted to work so we could spend more time together. And I used to tell Michael all the time, I would say, you got to stop doing this. In fact, it was a running joke. He'd say, I'm going to climb Saturday. And I'd say, can you do it next week? And he'd say, why? And I'd say, I don't really have time to go to your funeral this weekend. And we laughed about that. And one day, I grabbed Michael, and don't worry for your listeners, he never fell off a mountain. Um, uh, I grabbed him by the shoulders one day when he was going to, out to climb, and I said, honestly, stop doing this. And I said, because one of these days you're going to fall off a cliff and you're going to die. And Michael said something to me that was chilling at the time, chilling in a good way, goosebumps in a good way. He said, Jeff, you know what? He said he was, he was uh, you know, just past 40 years old. He said, I'll take. 40 years of living my life the way I live it instead of 90 years of just doing what everybody else is doing. And when he walked away, I was stunned because what well, I was stunned, Josh, because what I saw in his eyes was he totally meant that. And so later I, I, you know, I, I went home that night. I couldn't stop thinking about that because it was true. He was willing to trade, to have a 40 year life of living his way versus 90 years of just going through the motions. And so, unfortunately, you know, there is bad news. Uh, he never fell off a mountain, uh, but at 42, we lost him to a freak accident in the Irish Sea. Um, and so his life ended at 42 years old. And it was his eulogy, his parents wanted me to do the eulogy at the funeral, that I was sitting there thinking, what is the difference between Michael and everybody else? Why would he have taken that deal, right? And said, all right, I'll take the 40 years. I only get 40, but they're going to be really, really good. And the answer was that Michael had asked himself, what do I need to do with my life so that at any given point I can look back and say, no, man, I am living exactly the life I always dreamed of living. And that doesn't mean, Josh, that everything is good and that you don't have problems and you don't have mistakes. It's the other side of the balance sheet. It means that if you as a human being took a pencil right now and made a list of things you want to get done in your life so that when you look back one day, you will say, man, have I used my life well, even with all your mistakes. The goal is to look back. This is our definition of an epic life, Josh, is to look back and say, don't touch my life. I like it how it turned out, even with the bad parts. And you wouldn't want to trade your life. I, I say that because I see so many, I go to schools a lot, as you know. And sometimes kids, when I say, what do you, what's your definition of an ethic like? What do you want to be when you grow up? The age old question. Sometimes they say things like Beyonce. And I'm like, seriously? Uh, you know, and adults are like that. Instead of, well, let me put it this way. The energy you put into wishing you had someone else's life, why don't you put all that energy into making your life one that you wouldn't trade with anybody else? That's what Michael did. 
he spent his time making sure he didn't keep putting off the things he wanted to do. So Josh, the lesson was, and for all, all again, for all of your listeners, if, you, if I asked you right now to take out a piece of paper and write down one thing that you need to do, so you will look back like Michael and nod and say, time well spent. Whatever number of years and days you have on this planet, you spent it well. And I realized, I started asking people, Josh, and people don't do that. What they say to me was, yeah, well, I had dreams. People don't even like that word because it, 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 for some reason now the word dream seems irresponsible, which I find ridiculous. But people would say to me, yeah, when I was a kid, I had dreams. There were things I was going to do. But you know what, Jeff, you got to grow up at some point. I said, what does that mean? And they're like, well, I have a mortgage now. I have a family now. I have responsibilities now. And Josh, you've heard me say this before. Is that growing up or just giving up? Because it, accepting the fact that your job and your adult responsibilities are preventing you from living whatever life, whatever you wrote down on that sheet of paper that said, these are things that would make my life epic. Everybody's is different. It's just a weak excuse for giving up. Um, and so I, I, you know, I fundamentally believe uh, that as long as you have that list in front of you, you know that I write, used to write stuff on the bathroom mirror on a little index card and say, this is, this, these are the things I need to get done with my life. Your goals can be whatever they are, right? You've heard me, uh, Josh, tell the story of one of my employees whose epic life definition was, I got to be successful enough and work hard enough that I can buy my mother a house in Florida, paid fully cash up front to live the rest of her life in and get her out of this trailer park that she lives in. And so that was his epic life goal. I want to work really hard and do well so that one day I can hand my mom the keys to the front door of a house in Florida to get her out of the cold Northeast and out of this trailer park and this old rusted Airstream as a thank you for raising me. And I was like, that's an epic life if you can pull that off. So that is, that's what people don't do. They're so busy going to work. And, and so let me summarize it by this and then I'll stop. Um, it's that we accept that our, our job, our career, our adult responsibilities, um, and our dream, our epic life definition, that those two things are mutually exclusive, right? You, you, the, the, the cool thing, the things you wanna do in your life are things that you decide, if there's enough time left on the weekend, enough energy and enough money, then I'll do the stuff I always wanted to do. Instead of designing a job, a life, and a career, that takes you there. So my summary is this, your job, your career, your company, your career should be the vehicle that takes you to your epic life, not the obstacle that prevents you from getting there. I think that's the summary of, of everything we just talked about. Dreaming is something a lot of people frown upon. Like you mentioned, they see it as reckless or irresponsible. You were able to dream a bit because you had some incredible skills. You had some tech chops. Uh, you look at some of the geniuses who are in your league, Mark Zuckerberg, Bill Gates, folks who've dropped out of college. What advice do you have for people who are the younger guard? A lot of us as CEOs are kids. We as CEOs are passionate about learning and education but yet we're starting increasingly to look skeptically at the, the necessity of college. The world's on fire. Things are changing. People aren't even going in for classes at a lot of colleges next, next year. How important is college? And more broadly, as we think about getting the right kind of education, what guidance do you have? Okay. For us? I'm going to give uh, answers that are going to sound a little contradictory. Um, because I'm going to start by, what should I do first, the good news or the bad news? <laughs> the bad, of course. Get out of the way. So, all right. The bad news is that if college, we're going to call college one entity, if traditional education does not evolve and evolve quickly, enrollment will continue to decline, and I will not be surprised. Um, COVID, by the way, sending so many kids home where they had to learn online, made it even worse for, for higher ed. Let's say higher ed, because it's not just college, it's even high school, et cetera. Uh, but definitely college and university, uh, kids started saying, why would I even go back, right? 
And it's not, and I'm not talking about because of exposure to COVID, I'm talking about because they figured out they could do a lot of learning on their own and they weren't sure the value they were getting. So I do fundamentally believe that our educational model, and it's true worldwide, you know, I, I work with people all over the world and visit universities all over the world. The educational model was built on a paradigm that's got to be a century old, right? It's many decades old and it doesn't work anymore. Parts of it definitely do. Um, but I really do believe that if higher ed does not evolve, and then I'm going to talk about to what, to a new model, it's just going to keep losing kids. And it's going to be harder and harder to argue because they're already saying, why should I go to college? Why should I spend a huge amount of money learning a lot of stuff that I have no idea why I'll, that I'll ever need again? Um, <clears throat> I'm going to share a quick funny story with you. I was a commencement speaker at a university. And afterwards, parents, a lot of parents came up, but a family came up. They had two boys that looked around the same age. One had, was in his robe because he graduated. The other was in jeans. And the mother said, hey, we just wanted to thank you for your great commencement speech. And I turned to the son and said, congratulations on graduating. And I said, is this your brother? And he said, yeah, we're a year apart. Um, and I said, did you go here? And the family started laughing. He said, well, I did. And I said, sounds like I'm missing a story. So their sons both went off to college, the same university. They set up a fund where they sent the money to their, to, they gave them a fund. Here's all your money for the year to pay tuition, room and board and eat, right? So don't call us again till summer. And so both sons went away to college. At the end of that year, the one son came home. They told me the story. The parents are telling me this and said, mom, dad, I got a confession. They said, what? And he said, I didn't go to college. And they said, son, we sent you $40,000 at the beginning of the year. He said, yeah, I used it to fund my startup. <laughs> and they said, what? And he said, I was thinking the only reason I'm going to college is to learn a set of things so I can go start my own business. So instead, I took the 40 grand and I just funded my startup. So I wasn't in college all year. And I said, oh, my God. And I said, uh, you seem, you guys don't seem very upset. And the mother and the father laughed and they said, we were upset that he lied to us, but we weren't upset about the decision. I said, you weren't? And they said, Josh, no, we both work at his company now. I thought that was hilarious. <laughs> he said, we're employees of our son's company, so we ain't mad. So interesting decision, but here's the good news. The good news in the reason to go to college and the reason certainly for me that I stayed and finished is because the part people misunderstand is that you're not there. It's not that what they question is the stuff they're learning. And I'll be honest, I told some kids this one day, I had to learn how to like you did, like all of us did, how to compute the square root of a number. But never in my professional career have I been sitting in my office and a car came squealing into the parking lot, ran into our company and whipped out a credit card and said, quick, how much is the square root of a number, right? Nobody's ever asked me to do that again. That isn't the point, and that's what they're missing. The point is that it's about learning how to learn. As you know, I later got into, I'm a software engineer. So uh, I was involved in tech companies, Priceline.com and Ubid.com. These are all tech companies. But later, I launched a music company, and later I got into film, and now we're doing television production. Why was I able as an entrepreneur to launch companies in other industries? Because I'm a good learner. So why should you finish a college degree? Because you're learning how to learn. What I learned in, and, and, and I'll sort of summarize by saying this, uh, the things that I have to do as an entrepreneur to start a business. The first thing I had to do was research the problem in the industry. Guess who taught me how to do really good research? My history teacher. He constantly refined my research techniques. Then I have to write up a presentation of my ideas to pitch it to investors and other people. Guess who taught me how to present my ideas? My English teacher. She worked on, on my language skills and we took a public speaking class in school. Then I started a company and immediately one day we had a problem and all my employees were like, what do we do? And you know what was running through my head? The process, I said, write the problem on the board. And they're like, okay. And I said, now let's break this problem into as many smaller problems as we can. And we started this process. You know who taught me that? My engineering teacher. And then one day I was sitting through trying to unravel a complicated situation. 
and I used the logic that I learned in math and science, structured thinking, analytical thinking, problem solving, researching skills, communications and language skills. You're learning how to learn when you go to school, not the stuff that you learn. I was able to move into other industries because I know how to learn, not because I know the subject matter. Success leaves clues, my friend. <laughs> what can you like teach that. us about how to learn? Architect our day for us. So if, if you were designing a homeschooling curriculum, what would the day start out like on through to what the day would end with? And I know you start your days with info sponging. So don't skip over that because that's epic. Not to All overuse right. that word in this conversation. And so, okay. So we can, uh, 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 we can start with that uh, because that is how I start. The, uh, um, I, and, and, you know, the context of that, Josh, is that one day uh, I, I got very blessed as my career developed that I got to meet some of my business heroes. And I started wondering, these people that have achieved the success in their careers and lives that everybody else wants, I thought this, what are they doing that everybody else isn't? Because they must be doing something different or they wouldn't be where they are and everybody else wanting to get there. So I started intentionally studying the habits of successful people with this question. What are the things they're doing that I'm not? Um, and so one of the answers to that question uh, turned out to be that they are processing a much broader cross-section of the world, I'll explain that, than I was, than everybody else is. So let me, let me explain what that means. Let's say your startup is healthcare. So what do you do all day? You do healthcare. That's what you spend all your time. What kind of problems are you trying to solve? Gee, healthcare problems is what you're trying to solve because that's what industry you're in. You don't really care what's going on in banking or retail or anything. But what I noticed about these people is that they take a minute, they take time every day intentionally, they schedule time to go see what the rest of the world is doing to see, I'm gonna use the wrong word, to see if they can steal any of their ideas. And I don't mean steal in a bad way, I just mean if someone has a brilliant method for doing something, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. Maybe that's a good way to do it, right? It's not stealing to look at the way, uh, you know, LeBron James shoots a jump shot or the way Michael Jordan did and say, I wanna do it like that. So that's what I mean by stealing. I mean, emulating their practice. Um, so what I did was I developed this technique called info sponging and just made up the word, uh, where I said to myself, I, I noticed that these people take that time to look what every other industry is doing and see if they can be, this is the key, the first person in their industry to bring a great idea that some in other industry created into your industry. So info sponging is this every morning I start the day and I take, uh, the first, you only need 10 or 15 minutes of the day. Before you start your day, for 15 minutes, let's say, Josh, you don't work for healthcare and you don't work for your company. For 15 minutes a day, your, job, your assignment is to learn one new thing a day that you don't even need to know. So every day, I go and I, get, I leave my industry and my company, and whatever catches my attention, it's all about curiosity. I pick one thing that I'm going to learn today that I don't even know why I know it, why I'm learning it. And, and so what I do is I collect data points about, again, uh, what the rest of the world is doing out there. And I do that uh, so that I can try to find ideas that have never been brought into my industry and be the first one to bring them. So I'm going to summarize this so I can finish the day with a story that I read one day that really crystallized for me why you do this. And the story was, Way back when, it was in the Midwest, it was in Ohio, it was a hamburger, a burger joint, a chain. They were building cheeseburger restaurants and they weren't growing. And the owner said, we got to innovate. We got to lead the industry. We got to be the winners. What can we do? And his team did what I just said everyone else did. If you're in healthcare, you stare at the healthcare industry. They went inside and he said, find an innovation. And they looked at the French fry machine and they said, we can't make French fries any faster because the grease, if you heat up the grease anymore, it ruins the potato. They said, we can't fill the Diet Cokes any faster because they'll splatter. So they said, we have, we have no ideas because they were staring at their industry. But one of the guys, this is a true story, Josh, got in a car and he said, I'm gonna go visit some banks. And they're like, banks? Banks don't serve cheeseburgers and French fries. Who cares what they're doing? He said, I just wanna see if they might have a good idea in their industry. 
And they shook their head and said, have fun wasting your day. So <clears throat> he drove around. And in the first three banks, he learned nothing. But at the fourth bank he went to, there was pickup trucks in the parking lot. There was piles of wood. There was carpenters and hammers and nails. And he said, what are y'all doing out here in the parking lot? And they said, oh, our bank had a really cool idea. We're about to create it. And he said, what's your new idea? And they said, we came up with a brand new idea. When we finish building it, we're going to call it a drive-through window. And this guy said, holy crap. And he jumped in his car and he zoomed back to his hamburger restaurant. And thus was born the first, again, a true story, the first drive through window in fast food history did not come from any fast food vendor. It came from a guy who saw it at a bank, went back and said, let's do it here and sell, have a drive through window for cheeseburgers like the bank is doing. And the cool ending of the story is Ray Kroc heard about it and said, that's innovative. We need that at McDonald's. He bought this company. And the drive through window at McDonald's came from that acquisition. And now every fast food place has a drive through window that came from somebody looking to see if banks had good ideas. That's why you do info sponging. Take a few minutes every day to go see what the rest of the world is doing and maybe they have a good idea you can use. And, and Josh, to, to finish, the second part of the day for me after that is really- Wait, wait, what do you mean to finish? We're just start. we're 15 <laughs> minutes into our day. We're not finishing. <laughs> All right, well, we've got the renegade hamburger innovator who's invented a drive through and we're only 15 minutes into the day. Okay. <laughs> Take your time. Walk us through. Well, it's my favorite time uh, because I, I can't wait to see. It's like Christmas morning, right? When you read these stories, it's literally like unwrap, unwrapping a new present, but the present is a piece of knowledge, a shiny new piece of knowledge that who knows once you finish unwrapping it, what you can do with it. So I like this part of the day. Um, the second thing I do though, that I think is important, which is relationship management. Um, people have this bad habit of, uh, of calling you when they need something, right? Oh geez, I need finance help, I need to call Glenn. That's the guy that knows finance. I need more money, I need to call my investors, right? Whatever it is, we have, or there's a problem with the customer's payment, I need to call my customer, or I wanna sell them something. We have this habit of managing our relationships when they need managed. And I don't believe in that. I believe in the best call you can make is when I call an investor, one of our investors in the company, and he said, what do you need, Jeff? And I say, nothing, just checking in, how are you doing? He said, you don't need anything? And I'm like, no, I just wanted to see how you're doing, how's the family, you know, I know that you love fishing, have you done any fishing lately? Hey, there's a new barbecue place in town if you wanna grab lunch sometime. And you can see, uh, you know, if you, if you meet with them or if you do it on Zoom, you can see the expression that happens when you call somebody for no reason other than to let them know you value the relationship. And that's what people don't do. So I rotate the list on any given day. I have a mix of whether it's customers, investors, friends, um, family, or, you know, just young entrepreneurs that I know are struggling for me a big percentage of it because at Global Entrepreneurship Network, we do business in 180 countries. A big percentage of that, Josh, is WhatsApp. That I go to WhatsApp and I'm, because these people are all over the world. And you know, yesterday I was on the phone with uh, people in about four different African countries. That, that's what I was doing there and just checking in. So relationship management is something you do before you need people, let people stay connected, let them know you value them and just say hello, it matters. So I schedule time to just check in with people and do some relation management. So it's not until after all that, that I'm actually starting work uh, per se. Then the next thing I do is I take my to-do list and you have to accept the fact that you will never catch up on your to-do list. Stop letting it stress you out. You're never going to finish it. You're never gonna catch up. Because as soon as you cross one thing off, another thing pops up on the bottom of the list. So the next thing I do is ask this question. For this, usually I do it by week, but at least month, period of time. For this week, what is the most important thing I need to get done? What will advance the ball, let's use a sports term, what will move the ball down the field closer to the goal line? And I look at the, let's say there's 17 things on your to-do list. I look at the 17 things and I resort them every day in order. 
And then prior to this, by the way, I'm a very visual thinker. So I actually have that written as a list. And so I stare at that list and I say every morning before I start anything, which things, the top two things that will most get me closer to where I want to be the, at the end of this week. And I go do those two things and I don't worry about the other 15. And tomorrow I take the, the 17 that are whatever on the list and I do the same thing again. So I reset priorities for the day when I'm starting every single day. And I don't worry about all the stuff I didn't get done. I just make sure I get done the things that move the ball the most down the field. I hope that makes sense. Absolutely. I'm going to pick on this a little more because you've got so much to teach. Now, you don't build it into the structure of your day, but you've got big mess ups, things that just blow up. Take us into something that got blown up on your side, some big problem you faced, some challenge you ran up against, and a learning you took away from it. Well, I'll, I'll give you a really big one. This was many, many years ago. Um, we, uh, uh, <laughs> because it's gonna point back to what I just told you. Um, we had a, we made a giant mistake to a giant customer. Um, we had Procter & Gamble as a customer and one of the things the contract said clearly uh, was you have to implement all these measures to protect our proprietary data for about our company and our employees. Our data is our data. And if you ever share any of our data with any other company, you're done. Contracts, contracts over and you're probably in trouble. And I had an employee accidentally send one of their data files to another company. And so, uh, that was really, everything exploded. By a long shot, our biggest customer, we made a mistake that was embarrassing. It was horrifying. We didn't know the repercussions and we just lost our single biggest customer. So in minutes, I've suddenly lost a massive chunk of my revenue stream and probably my reputation. Super bad. So it feels like your entire world is collapsing. And it felt that way. Because not only am I gonna lose this giant customer, but I'm embarrassed professionally. And if they tell other people what we did, this might be the end of my business. So there's your crash and burn horrifying moment. But now, in fact, let me tie this to something else. Let me tie this instead to values. Um, because we always focused on running a company by our values and making them very visible. Um, and, and, you know, and values, you lead with your values. And one of the values we always talk to people about was, uh, employees about was, uh, I'll summarize it, say humanity first, meaning that people count the most and take care of people, make people decisions above profit decisions and the rest will work itself out because you want to be a long-term player. And a lot of times when you make a decision based solely on the profit of that transaction, you're foregoing a, long, a life lifelong relationship with a client that has way more value over the length of the relationship. So in any case, we wanted to make sure that humanity first, that that's the way it came across. So we had an interesting moment. When we contacted, I got the call, right, from the big execs uh, at, at, at P&G. Jeff, you know what happened already. I said, yes. He said, and I don't have to tell you what goes next. And I said, we're fired. He said, yeah, that says right in the contract that this terminates the contract immediately. And I was just horrified, sick to my stomach, Josh. And then he said, uh, um, he said, you know, we just had our, our morning staff meeting where we went around the table and everybody agreed that the contract was officially terminated by your actions. I said, correct. And I, he said, and I'm sure we're one of your top 10 customers. And I was like, I didn't say this, but you're the biggest one by a big margin. This was a problem, but I didn't say that. I said, yes, sir. And he said, except something happened after the official vote to terminate you. And I looked up and I said, what? And he said, everybody asked me not to. This was the CFO of that multi-billion dollar company at the time. And I said, huh? He said, my team said, even though the contract's over and you violated it, you made a huge mistake. They asked me to please not end this relationship. And I was like, I'm confused. And he said, while we were talking, about terminating you, a couple of our team told some stories and I'll just share one with you because that, 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 that's what he did. He said, I understand you have this culture of take care of people first and profits will work themselves out, right? Not that, not that efficiency and all those things don't matter, but people always have to come first. And I said, yes, sir, that's our philosophy. 
And he said, well, Jeff, here's a little story I heard in my staff meeting this morning I didn't know about. He said, one of our employees, and this stuff's very real, Josh. He said, one of our employees got promoted to vice president in recent months. And when she got promoted, sorry to be so real, but this is what happened. He said, uh, she, um, she ran home at lunch. She was the breadwinner in her family and her husband was stayed home with the kids and worked part-time. She ran home at lunch to tell her husband that she just got that open v, v, VP job and she was super excited. And when she ran home at lunch, she found her husband at home in bed with her best friend. And so her life fell apart the same moment she got the thing she'd been dreaming of her whole career. Then the company said, you need to hit the road tomorrow because part of your new VIP role is you have to visit all our locations. And she had no childcare because her husband was doing it. Her husband, he, she had just left the home and never came back. That same day she got promoted. She said, I don't have a nanny, I don't have a babysitter, I can't travel, I'm devastated. I don't know what to do. Well, our account manager at my company through asking her, remember what I talked about relationship management? Don't call people when you want something. Call them to say hi. She had called this customer one day, found her in tears, and said, you don't have to tell me anything, but if you want, I I'll listen. Learned all this stuff. So here's what the, the executive told me. He said, your employee has been house-sitting and babysitting our vice president's kids so that she could travel. And she's been hanging with her until she got a little emotionally stronger. And he said, nobody here wants to terminate this agreement. In fact, we like to renew it. Just don't make that mistake ever again. And I just sat there stunned. And I went down the hall to the employee and I said, uh, can I talk to you? And she said, am I fired? I said, why would you be fired? And she said, I uh, guess you found out what I've been doing on, my, you know, on nights and weekends. And I said, you think I'm gonna fire you for that? And she said, well, I didn't tell anybody. And I said, I'm coming down here to tell you, you're getting a bonus for living our values, for doing an amazingly cool thing, and for literally being the reason our largest client doesn't wanna fire us at our worst moment. So I know that was a long story, uh, but living by values, literally saved the company at that moment in time. That would have been devastating to us. And instead, uh, when, the, when the worst moment happened, our best behavior was revealed and it wound up making all the difference in the world. That's what came to mind that moment when you said, because I thought, I thought we were over when that happened. Wow. Like people talk about the weather and their day, you talk about these nuggets of wisdom. <laughs> it's just incredible. You once were asked, I think by someone in our group, um, what, do you, what do you think is more important, the journey or the destination? You said it's actually really the people you bring along with you. It's neither journey nor destination per se. And when I think of the right people in my life, I think of the values. Ultimately, the wrong people are people who just don't click and, and like a bad virus. They just get repelled from me, from our company, from other companies as well. How do you figure out who the right people are okay. when you're bringing people into your life? In work, this woman, generally, give us a sense for that. I think that's a great question. And there's a part of it that's magic. And that magic is, for example, what happened the first time you and I met, right? There are people you just know. You connect to and you know you'll be in each other's lives forever. Sometimes that just happens, but there is the underlying reason. Um, and I think it is a couple of things. Um, one, on, I'll, I'll do the personal and the professional. So, cause you said bringing people into your life. Sometimes that's personally and the other time it's, it's hiring and building teams. So let's do the personal first. I think the personal part is being really focused on where you're trying to go in your life. And, and I usually, by the way, this is what I do on a once per year basis. At the start of the year, I make a list of how I want to grow this year. What do I want to do that's different? What do I want to learn? Like one time that's, you know, was the music biz, right? I wanted to actually, by the end of this year, I want to know how the music business works uh, in an industry. You might want to learn Mandarin. You might want to make a goal. I know somebody, 
she said to me one day, I don't have very many friends. So by the end of this year, I want to have a group of six girls that I consider my girls, my best friends. She actually had a goal. I'm going to work harder at having friends to go do fun stuff with. She said to me, I've never been on a girl's trip. So because I don't really have a friend group, she said, so by the end of the year, the proof will be that me and my new friends are on a girl's trip. Then I'll know I've hit the goal. That's a real goal. Okay. So every year I sit down and say, how do I want to grow this year and change? What do I want to do? Now that leads to the next part. Personally in your life, you need to look around and you know, I'm talking about something that, that everybody's heard a million times, but you really are the sum total of the people around you. And you need to say, if this is my goal in my life in a year, or it might be many years, but whatever it is, are, am I surrounded by people that deter me and bring me down? Or am I surrounded by people that contribute to my growth and help me get there? Whatever person you're trying to become, you need to be around people that are getting you there. So if you don't know, my answer to that one, Josh, is if you don't know who you're trying to be and where you're trying to go and how you want to grow, you'll never be able to identify which people should stay in your life and which people shouldn't. And you won't recognize when a Jeff meets a Josh and says, this is a guy I want to have in my life because it's accretive, right? It's additive to what I'm trying to be. So that's the personal part is you got to first answer what you're trying to be. On the professional part, it's, I think, very much, well, well let me tell you the story that made me think of it. We had interviews uh, in one of my companies and we would bring people in and they usually interview with six or seven people. And we had two people coming in one day and in the morning, the, the, uh, the guy that was interviewing got there first and some of the employees, uh, we had a break room and in the morning people were usually having coffee and making their breakfast in the microwave or whatever. And they, he comes in and he's in the break room with employees and they're chatting with them and people come out of the room and they're not shaking their head. I said, what? And they said, we don't even want to interview him today. He's not one of us. I said, what do you mean? We have six interviews set up. They said, just send him home. He's not one of us. Then this girl comes in and same thing. They're in the break room. They're sitting with her and they're like, she's totally one of us. You should hire her. I said, we haven't done any interviews yet. And they said, the, the interviews are going to go great. We'll do them, but we're already going to tell you right now how this day is going to end. She's one of us. So my question, Josh, to your listeners is what does one of us mean? One of us is a group that you are a member of, that you want to be a member of, and you want other people to meet the same criteria, but you don't know what that is if you haven't defined it. So as a leader, as a CEO, I think you not only need to define those values but, and that culture, but you need to write it down. So that, that what I was telling you about earlier, humanity first, humanity first when people talk about vision statements and value statements, a lot of times there's 14 of them and they're really lofty and they don't guide. Here's the way I want you to think of your values. Your values should be a short sentence that literally tells me what to do when I'm confused. That's my best way to explain it. So I've got an upset customer and they want a refund, but we did nothing wrong. The customer was wrong. And you're, my person's on the phone and they glance up and on the wall, it says humanity first. And they say, I know what I'm supposed to do here. Sir, you can have your money back. I'm sorry about the situation. And then they're telling me, hey boss, I just gave him his money back even though it was our fault. That's humanity first. That's values that we wrote out so our employees, when they were in their most confused moment, knew what decision to make. That is how, again, I want you to answer the question for your company, what does one of us mean? How would you know when someone walks in your office and you're chatting with them, you say, oh man, she's totally one of us. She'll do great here. How did you know that? And the reason our employees knew that is because they knew exactly the culture that we lived in and, and how we want, it was, on the, it was literally written on the wall. You couldn't be confused about what mattered to us. Apart from values, uh, there's your Diet Coke. I remember when you joined us last, I had to get a whole case of Diet Coke to keep you going. <laughs> you had pulled an all-nighter, by the way, which did not get lost on anyone. That yeah, was epic. <laughs> Everything you do is freaking epic. But, I'm trying yeah, to do my part. That was special. So you've got values, but then you've got this other thing. Call it whatever you will. People have lots of names. The, the hedgehog concept, the eighth habit, the core focus, but that one thing that company exists to do, sell more flowers. We had someone who meshed really well with our values. And after about the two-year point, we parted ways. We love her. 
a lot of mutual affection, simpatico, but she didn't resonate with our purpose of challenging entrepreneurial leadership teams to think differently. When someone embraces the values, right, when they're one of you, but they don't really care deeply about the company's ultimate mission, what do you do? Yeah, so I, I, I think I'm going to give you two words for CEOs, swift and decisive. I hate to say it, and you might love that person as a human, but you got to be swift and decisive and you can't allow it. Uh, the person that is a good person but is rolling their eyes when the CEO is explaining the vision and the mission uh, cannot work there because that cancer spreads in a way that you'll never hear as the CEO, as the leader. You won't see it, and it spreads fast. Um, you simply cannot afford to have – what you're thinking is, I can't afford to fire that person because they're a contributor or and or you really like that person, but you can't – the truth is you can't afford to keep them. Because while you're afraid of firing them to lose their productivity, what you're failing to realize is the net productivity is a loss because of the negative effect they have on everybody around them in the office. You just don't see that. And the way you see that was the first time I had that situation and I fired the person, productivity went up, even though we were short a, a, a person. And I said, how is productivity up? And they said, he was like a dark cloud. Once you got him out of the office, everybody's mood changed. And I was like, I guess I hadn't thought of that. And they're like, I said, why didn't someone tell me? And they said, because he was the top performer and we know you like him. And, you know, they're like, what were we going to go do? Go say our star quarterback is a jerk or doesn't believe the team's mission. They're like, we just felt like, you know, criticizing the best performer and we know you like him was a bad idea. And so no one, it, it may be happening that no one else will mention it to you. But once you tell that person, look, I don't think you really believe in what we're doing here. So let's find you someplace else to work and we'll get you replaced. And then all of a sudden you see everybody else's everything from attitude to productivity change when that person's removed. I say you have to be swift, swift and decisive and you can't keep those people. Let's talk about shifting gears a little bit. So it's like the twin of learning, which you're passionate about. You're passionate about problem solving. Problem solving is front and center in our lives. You got dealt a pretty tough deck as a guy who travels constantly, never, ne almost never endingly around the globe to do what you do toward your purpose of helping people, more people live epic lives. Suddenly the travel screeches to a halt. How do you solve that problem? Take us through what the last half year has been like for you. Um, you know, uh, immediately for me, uh, because again, we do, since we do work all over the world, um, I was like, this was a huge bad wow, right? For me, uh, when this happened. Um, uh, because I said, how am I going to do what I do? Uh, since it relies so heavily on travel. Um, but it wound up having, in these last few months, a huge positive effect. Um, because frequently, a lot of what I do, well, there's two, there's two, here are the two negatives. The positives are I get human interaction. As you know, Josh, I'm not a handshake guy, I'm a hug guy. Um, and uh, one time something occurred to me, uh, because somebody said to me, uh, what if I don't like hugs? And I was like, Odds are, if you are that upset about me giving you a hug, you're, we're probably not going to, you're not one of us anyway. We're probably not going to be friends. If you have some social condition or something, that's different. But somebody said that to me. So I like the, the interaction of being in person, of seeing body language, of hugging people, of sitting and laughing with them. You know, that, that's, that's so important to me. Um, so suddenly we lost that. But um, the flip side of that is when I go in person, by definition, you can only chat with and hug a limited number of people that are physically right around you. And I do a lot of speaking. When you're on a stage, you go up on the stage, you speak, and then you leave. And all the people are sitting in all those rows, and you're wondering what they're thinking, but you're the one talking, and they're sitting out there in the dark. No interaction. Here's the positive that has come out of this time. Um, I have done sessions like this, but live interactive sessions on everything from Zoom to Jitsi to stream yard to, I mean, pick a product. I've been on all of them, and including television and radio. Um, but uh, 
uh, on these interactive platforms, I have been able to talk to people, actually we counted up in 110 countries just since COVID hit. And I've been able to do it interactively where I can see them and they can ask questions. So I've been spending many, many days uh, since, since COVID um, online for many, many, yesterday I think it was a 12 hour day online talking to people, answering questions specifically to help people get through this time. <coughs> so virtually I've been able to travel to 100 countries in three months and I've been able to have one-on-one -on -one conversations where people are asking me direct questions with hundreds, if not thousands of people all over the world, which I could not do when I, had to, when I was flying all day. And one other thing I just wanna add that I mentioned to you before, my commitment has been uh, in, in entrepreneurship. Uh, I know you've heard me say this, but entrepreneurship is not a job, it's a mindset, and it's the mindset of self-determination, right? You should design your future you should achieve economic independence, economic freedom. You should be able to take care of yourself, your family, your community, all those things by building profitable businesses, right? Building businesses and making money is not wrong, right? There's no shame in that. The shame is in not using your success to help your community. Um, so I want more people to be successful so they can help your community. But out of the bad, uh, you know, of COVID, some good came out of it. And, uh, well, I will just mention that in case it can help anybody listening. Um, we noticed that uh, these government PPP program for small business owners um, is not getting to a lot of small business owners, specifically minority owned businesses. We saw five categories, we got data. Um, uh, black owned businesses, Latino owned businesses, um, women owned businesses, LBGTQ owned businesses and veteran owned businesses. Those five categories have roughly, but black owned and Latino owned were the worst. 91% of the ones that applied for the government PPP small business funding did not get it. So what we said was out of the bad comes an opportunity to do good. So we've created our own program. Um, and we is my organization, Global Entrepreneurship Network with our partners, a company, a small business resource firm called Hello Alice. Uh, we have teamed and we just created our own grant program. And we just started handing out $10,000 cash grants. They're not loans, it's just cash. And it's not government money, it's private money. We're just giving out $10,000 to as many small business owners as that will actually help. If the people who need it most, if 10 grand will keep somebody's family fed uh, for a while while they struggle through this, then we wanna give it to them. And you might've seen it, uh, one of my, my business partner and close friend, uh, Pitbull, uh, the singer, the rapper, Pitbull. Um, he and I have, been re have recorded a television public service announcement. We've been on all the media uh, talking about if you need help, and I'll just tell uh, your listeners if they know somebody who could, who could use the help, it's covid19businesscenter.com. covid19businesscenter.com. We also offer mentorship and other resources there in addition to handing out $10,000 cash grants. So my point is, during this time where everything was bad, it enabled us to actually do more of the good that we've been trying to do in the world anyway. When, when you see the, you know, the emotional calls, sometimes we do surprise Zooms, by the way, where our team calls somebody and said, hey, we're calling you about your application for the 10 grand. And they say, yeah, did I fill out something wrong? And we get to say, well, will $10,000 cash really make a difference in your life right now? And a lot of times they'll say, I figured out how I can get by on 3,800 a month. So it'll, it'll, it'll keep me alive for three months or whatever. And then we say, great, because we just sent it to you. And the emotion and the tears and the moments, you're like, it's not, it, it's not a responsibility. It's like a privilege to get to do this. You know, we don't got to help these people. We get to help these people. And when you see their reaction, when they find out that we're helping them, it's so, it's a blessing. You say, wow, I can't believe I'm lucky enough that I get to help people in a time like this. So there's been a silver lining and it's been really cool. You contribute in so many ways. You help people as a mentor. You're helping with these loans. The people you're talking to here, the CEOs and visionaries out there, a lot of them are mentors. They like to amplify their impact. Any guidance you have for CEOs who'd like to mentor more or more effectively or otherwise amplify their platform for Absolutely. value? Absolutely. So that's a great question, Josh. Um, the, uh, um, first of all, mentorship, even though I just talked about money, that's only because COVID's an emergency. 
over the long haul, mentorship is way more valuable than money, right? It's, it's a fish versus teaching people how to fish. So giving them a little money, right now we have to do that uh, because people are literally starving. But post COVID in a normal world, your time, your mentorship and your knowledge is way more valuable than any check you'll ever write. They both count, but mentorship's most value. So the first tip I'm gonna give to that question, Josh, is a lot of people uh, count themselves out. They tell me, well, I'm not a mentor. And I'll say something like, why are you not a mentor? And they'll say like, well, for most of my life, I was a corporate employee or executive. And so they think that because if they didn't build the company or they were hired to run it or whatever, that has nothing to do with mentorship. Mentorship is about the mapping of something you know because you've done it and somebody that needs to know how to do that. So quit ruling yourself out as a mentor because you're not the CEO or because you are the CEO but you were hired to do the job, you didn't build the company or because prior to your company you spent a lot of years in corporate. Here's a perfect example. I would started a company, I'm an engineer. I had no idea what the letters HR meant, right? I'm an engineer, HR handled that our whole life. And so when I asked people for mentorship, that I remember talking to this one woman and she said, I work for a Fortune 500 company in the HR department. I can't mentor startups. And I was like, what do you do there? And she told me, I said, you just listed all the stuff I don't know how to do. So what I'm telling you is no matter who you are, you have knowledge somebody needs. There is no reason for anybody listening to us today not to mentor. So the second part of that is you need to be proactive. One, there are mentoring organizations around the country, but I will be honest, there aren't enough. And where you, wherever you live, you might not be able to find one. So if you can't find one, create the opportunity. On your LinkedIn profile, put, I live in Chicago and I'm open to mentoring, uh, you know, whatever type of people, startups, executives, rising executives in, in companies, whatever it is, entrepreneurs. You need to reach out in your own community and get the word out that you are willing, that you are an available mentor and you're willing to make some of your time. You will find our organizations when you start looking, right? If you wanna mentor women in business, if you Google women in business Chicago, wherever you live, right? There's gonna be some organization where women meet monthly or weekly to talk about business that you can proactively call and say, do some of the women there need mentors? So what I'm telling you is quit waiting for someone to invite you. Uh, and go out and, and make yourself known in the community and people will snap up the chance to learn from you no matter who you are. We've soaked up such extraordinary value and are so fortunate to have had your time now. One last question. All right. Who's one more great mentor or guide we could interview and bring wisdom to our entire community? From um, one of my favorites, but uh, I have to put an asterisk because he's a really good friend. <laughs> <laughs> so, but uh, I'm, I'm, biased. I'm biased uh, uh, when I say this about him, but I still believe it. Uh, but of course, I'm going to say this about my friend. Uh, uh, it's Mark Victor Hansen, the uh, co-author of the Chicken Soup for the Soul book series. Um, the way Mark approaches everything, I just love him to death. So as soon as you said that, I thought of Mark. Obviously, Jack Canfield wrote the Chicken Soup for the Soul book series, which is like the I think second most successful series of books in the history of books, um, something like that. But uh, Mark's, uh, the way Mark summarizes the way the world works and what's important is absolutely brilliant. So he'd be a wonderful interview. And now, you know, having spent time at your events with your community, I'm saying that knowing a lot of the members of your community, I think he'd be great if you want to reach out to him. I appreciate that, Jeff. I love you, man. You are like no one else on this planet. I do have one more question. How the hell can I or we help you? Um, everything we just talked about, the last part was really good. Reach out and mentor someone in your community, right? But, you know, most days for me end with me thinking about all the people I didn't have time <laughs> that I wish I could help that I can't or the requests I get that I have to reply, say I'll get to you someday when I can. So, you know, for me, the ripple effect is what matters. I love hearing stories. And by the way, I've gotten them from, you know, members, from hell members. Somebody that said, 
that when you and I were at that event with them physically, I've had some of, some of your people, Josh, send me a note that said, after I left listening to you, I was thinking about it and I decided to take action and I did blank. Uh, so the ripple effect is important. None of us will be able to help all the people we want to help. But, you know, it's the Mother Teresa quote. She once said, if you can't feed 100 people, then feed one. Uh, because if 100 people do that, we've got progress. So that's my answer. Uh, go out and do something in your community. And if you get a chance, uh, let me know, because I love hearing those stories. I'm really easy to find. It's just jeff at jeffhoffman.com. We're going to come find you, my friend. All right, Thank buddy. You. Love you lots. So and much. See you again in real life.